and it turned out that God used that or something they said or then you can speak into their lives and you can believe things. They 
had gone through. Uh, King Jehoram lasted three months. Uh, his son Jehoiakim, I'm sorry, his brother Jehoiakim became king. That's when Babylon came and they took him and they put Jehoiachin. He lasted a number of years. Jehoiachin was Jehoiakim's uh, son. And then they took him into exile. There is a series of exiles just as Jeremiah had prophesied. He had prophesied all of this and the people weren't listening. Even though they saw the thing that he was prophesying happening, they still wouldn't listen. And finally, uh, Jehoiachin's gone and they put uh, their uncle, Zedekiah, in place. So we pick up the story from there. Zedekiah is now a little afraid, and so he's looking for Jeremiah. We pick up the story of Jeremiah chapter 38, verse 14. Then King Zedekiah sent for Jeremiah the prophet, and had him brought to the third entrance to the temple of the Lord. I'm going to ask you something, the king said to Jeremiah. Do not hide anything from me. Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, if I give you an answer, will you not kill me? Even if I did give you counsel, you would not listen to me. But King Zedekiah swore this oath secretly to Jeremiah. As surely as the Lord lives who has given us breath, I will neither kill you nor hand you over to those who want to kill you. Uh, people wanted to kill Jeremiah just because what? Because he was telling them the truth that they didn't want to hear. We continue in verse 17. Then Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, this is what the Lord God Almighty, the God of Israel, says. If you surrender to the officers of the king of Babylon, your life will be spared and the city will not be burned down. You and your family will live. But if you will not surrender to the officers of the king of Babylon, this city will be given into the hands of the Babylonians and they will burn it down. You yourself will not escape from them. King Zedekiah said to Jeremiah, I'm afraid of the Jews who have gone over to the Babylonians, for the Babylonians may hand me over to them, and they will mistreat me. They will not hand you over, Jeremiah replied. Obey the Lord by doing what I tell you. Then it will go well with you, and your life will be spared. But if you refuse to surrender, this is what the Lord has revealed to me. All the women left in the palace of the king of Judah will be brought out to the officials of the king of Babylon. Those women will say to you, they misled you and overcame you, those trusted friends of yours. Your feet are sunk in the mud. Your friends have deserted you. All your wives and children will be brought out to the Babylonians. You yourself will not escape from their hands, but will be captured by the king of Babylon, and this city will be burned down. There were two fates that were presented to King Zedekiah, two choices given to him to choose from. One would lead to life, and the other would lead to death and destruction. And we're going to take some very valuable lessons from this story so that when it comes to us, we will make the right choice. Let me say amen. amen. The first thing that we get from this story is that the right way to choose a path is to ask God for his counsel. Wouldn't you agree with that? The right way to ask, to, to choose, is to ask God for his counsel. As a matter of fact, Zedekiah did that in verse 14. It says, then King Zedekiah sent for Jeremiah the prophet. That's how you would ask of the Lord and inquire of the Lord. And had him brought to the third entrance to the temple of the Lord, I'm going to ask you something that King said to Jeremiah. Do not hide anything from me. He wanted to know what the Lord had to say. And, and that's about the only thing that this king did right. The one thing he did right is that he asked, he inquired, uh, he wanted to know what God had to say. And if we have the Lord to ask, the question for us is, why don't we ask? I think there are a lot of reasons why we don't ask. I think one of the reasons we don't ask is we're afraid what he might say. We're afraid that he won't agree with what we want to do and with the plan that we have. So uh, we choose one of those boxes and, and, and just go with that instead of asking God. Proverbs 16, 3 says, commit to the Lord whatever you do and he will establish your plans. How many say amen? amen? And the question is, you know, since we don't know, right? We're, we're so clueless that we don't know what's going to happen in 10 minutes from now. We have no idea. I could end my sermon, which is highly unlikely, 
in 10 minutes? Or who knows what can happen? Right? God knows the beginning and the ending of our days. Why wouldn't we ask God which path we should take? Think about that. We don't even bother to ask or we ignore or we don't know that we should. But right now, we have no excuse because I just told you you should. Amen? We need to ask the Lord because He knows everything. He knows what will happen. So the right way to choose a path is to ask the Lord for His counsel. The next thing we learn from this story is that it's foolish to ask for God's counsel and then not follow it. Jeremiah 13, uh, 38, verse 15 says, Even if I did give you counsel, you would not listen to me. Zedekiah had a history of not listening. In, in, in Jeremiah chapter 37, it says, Neither he nor his attendants nor the people of the land paid any attention to the words of the Lord had spoken through Jeremiah the prophet. He had proven that he wouldn't listen to the Lord. So that, that's the question, right? Because if we do uh, pass that first test, the first test is to ask the Lord in the first place. The second test is, will you do what the Lord says? And sometimes what he tells you to do, uh, you're not so sure of, right? Because it sounds risky. It's not what you were thinking, right? When the Lord began to speak to our hearts about leaving where we were in, in New York to come here to Maryland, I, I you know, I didn't want to go. Uh, I had no reason to want to go anywhere. I was fine where I was, except that God had called us. So I wanted to make sure. I was asking God, is this you? Because if it's you, I will go. But if it's not, I'm not going anywhere. Amen? Amen. But you know what? A, a lot of things, those of, I don't know if there's any, I know that we have a few people uh, in our congregation that are professional counselors. But um, I, I know that they have this experience that one of the things that that is not good about counseling, I've counseled a lot of people, is that a lot of people don't follow the counsel. Right? A lot of people seek counsel, but when it comes to following the counsel, they don't do it, and they stay, and you have to watch what you know is going to happen, not because you're clairvoyant, but because the Word tells us what's going to happen when you don't follow the right counsel and when you go your own way. Jesus had a lot to say about that matter as well. One of the most famous places and one of the most famous things he said about it was Matthew chapter 7, verses 26 and 27. He said this, But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. And of course, the rain, the wind, the streams, a beating against the house represents life beating up against you. And if you don't follow the counsel of the Lord, then you're not going to be able to stand. Only what God says is going to help you to make you stand. And the question for all of us today is, if God is saying something, why don't we listen? And it's because I think that we don't have in our mind that there are two fates. There are two choices to make. We think that there's a third choice, ours. Trust me, there's not. There's one choice or another choice that God gives, and we need to follow. Here's another lesson from this very important story. The path to life is in what God tells you to do. If God is telling you to do something, then there's life in it. He never tells you anything uh, that will hurt you or destroy you. Jeremiah 38, 17, from the passage of Scripture that we read, then Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, this is what the Lord God Almighty, the God of Israel, says, if you surrender to the officers of the king of Babylon, your life will be spared and the city will not be burned down. You and your family will live. God, by the way, this the king was a wicked king. He was not following the Lord at all. Yet God in his mercy is giving him a chance here. He's saying, look, because of the sin of all the people, uh, you are going to go into exile. 
But listen, I will save your life and the life of your family if you just surrender to the kingdom of Babylon. I will take care of you if you do that. You, you will save your life and, and the life of your family. There's life in what God tells you to do, even if you don't understand it. You know, there are things that I didn't know would happen, right? All, all throughout my life. How many, that's, you know, life has been a surprise. Anybody else here? Raise your hand. Life has been a surprise to you. Yeah, I remember we were celebrating uh, our New Year's Eve here, right? Uh, saying goodbye to 2019 and welcoming 2020. Did anybody have any idea that I'd be staring at a bunch of faces with masks on? The other day I was going to the store with my son, and I was telling him, you know, we have two choices here. We can go and buy something, or we can go and hold the place up. Because we got masks. We have two choices. <laughs> you don't know what's going on, you know. I feel like a graffito a, a bandito over here. You don't know what, what, what's going to happen. But who, who thought or imagined that everything that has happened from, ja well, from January to now July, we're more than halfway through the year. Is that crazy or what? Who ever thought that we'd be here? Who ever thought that we'd have to take chairs out of, of, of the auditorium? because of, of uh, all that went on. The whole, who would have thought that the whole world will come to a standstill through one virus? Who would have thought that? Who would have thought that all the unrest in the world would happen? You know, we hear about things that might happen, but we never believe that they will. But here we are. But God knew it all along. And here's what he says, Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you declares the Lord. The plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. That's why I want to invest in what God tells me to do. Because I know that His plans are to help me, to bless me, because He loves me as the loving Father that He is. My own plan, which, I, you know, if I cook it up, it sounds good. Doesn't it look good, the plan that you come up with? It's like Man, this is this is gonna happen. This is this is it. This is happening. Boy, wait till the world sees this, right? And then you go on, and then all of a sudden something happens, right? I had a friend who his uh, love was so bad that he he said, you know, if I plan to open up a hat store, people will start being born without heads. That's how bad my love is. Why take a chance on anything? When God wants to show you the way to life, there's life in what the Lord Jesus says. How many say amen? amen? 1 John 2, 17 says, The world and his desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Whoever does the will of God lives forever. And by the way, experience life with blessing. And even, you know, that blessing... Uh, surpasses even situations that you go through, right? There are situations that uh, my wife and I have faced and we're facing now, but even with that, we can say that God is with us and that he's blessing us anyway, and that we have joy anyway, and that we have peace anyway. He's the reason for our joy and our peace. We're not waiting for a circumstance or a situation to save us. Somebody say amen. amen. So the path to life is in doing what God tells you to do. It's very simple, actually, but very complicated, isn't it? Because we complicate it. Here's another lesson from that story that we read. The path to death and destruction is disobedience. That's the path to death and destruction. In verse 18 of chapter 38, we read this, but if you will not surrender to the officers of the king of Babylon, this city will be given into the hand of the Babylonians, and they will burn it down. You yourself will not escape from them. It's interesting, right, that uh, our actions many times don't just affect you. Our actions many times affect those around you. Our actions many times affect 
our families, our actions many times affect the people that are within our influence. We're just thinking, I'm going to do this, and if I, it doesn't work. No, there's a lot of consequence because we are connected, right, to different people. And, and when something happens or something happens to your life, it affects other people's lives. And God knows that. Many times we're just thinking selfishly, I'm just doing this and nobody knows I'm just doing this for myself. But no, you're connected to other people and those people too will suffer. I love Proverbs 14, 12. It's a warning, but I love this warning because it's so true. There's a path before each person that seems right. But in the end, it ends in what? Now let me ask you, those of you here, I'm sure I know the answer to this, but how many of you have ever taken a path and you were sure that you were sure that you were sure that that was the way to go? And then you took it and you found out that was not the way to go. Anybody here that's in the going the wrong way club thinking that it was the right way to go? You're sure of it, right? And this is this is it. You forgot to ask, but it seemed right. And there's a story in the in the Old Testament about Joshua, who's a godly man, and uh, you know he was supposed to defeat all the enemies. And there were these people called the Gideonites that had heard how the God of Israel was just helping Israel conquer all that territory. They got afraid, and so they got dressed up like uh, like they were worn out clothes. Uh, they even, they were smart. They got, I, I don't know, they got moldy bread. I don't know if you go to the store and buy moldy bread, but they showed up with moldy bread and with worn out sandals and worn out clothes and put dust on themselves. And they said, oh, we're from a far away land. You know, we want to make peace with you. And Joshua, being a wise man, how do we know that you're from a far away land? You know, come on. You could be a neighbor. So, oh, but look at our clothes. Look at our sandals. Look at this bread. You want some of this bread? You want a jelly sandwich on this? Thing? <laughs> no, no. Okay, you must be from far away, right? And it turned out that they were neighbors, and they weren't supposed to make a pact. God told them not to make a pact with, with people that were near them. And guess what? If you follow the history of all of that, that decision cost them a lot of heartache. It wasn't too long there that they had to, we were in a war because of it, to protect those people who they were supposed to have their land. All because they didn't ask God, they disobeyed. You know, our natural default position is disobedience. Did you know that? Our natural position is disobedience because of our sinful nature. Our, our mind has been affected or infected by wrong thinking. And, and all you have to do is look at a, a little child, right? When they get to about two years old and they learn the word no, they go to town with that no, don't they? Right away, they become defiant. Pick up your toy, no. And they say, just like that, no. And you gotta say it that way, no. And, and, and you learn that while you have to teach a child a lot of lessons until they get it to be obedient, hopefully, maybe, somewhat, you don't have to teach them how to be disobedient. They kind of come included in the package when you get your child. You know how things are pre-programmed? You know, you get your Alexa and it's programmed. You say, hello, Alexa. And she goes, hi, how are you? <laughs> well, they come pre-programmed to be disobedient because that's who we are. That's who we are. And, and it leads to very, very bad consequences for us. I, I know that I have personally suffered from some very, very bad decisions that I thought were good decisions because I didn't ask the Lord. It's only by His mercy and grace that I'm here to tell you about some of them. Amen? How many have traveled down that road with me and have a little few scars to, to show for it? Amen. Thank God.
God for his mercy. Here's something else we learned from the story. Your own logic will cause you to disobey God. Your lot of mind will tell you to disobey God. Jeremiah 38, 19. King Zedekiah said to Jeremiah, I'm afraid of the Jews who have gone over to the Babylonians, for the Babylonians may hand me over to them, and they will mistreat me. Now, keep in mind, that was his excuse. That was his logic. If, if I get sent, or if I do what God says, is what he's saying, then I'm going to be mistreated over there. But Jeremiah had just told him that if you surrender to the king of Babylon, that he will, his, he will save his life and the life of his family, and Israel wouldn't be burned down. So he's saying, in a way, God doesn't know what he's doing. Because if I do what God says, I will be in trouble. Meanwhile, he had learned, or he had heard about the two faiths. If he surrenders to the king of Babylon, he will live and so will his family and Israel won't burn down. But if he doesn't, Israel will burn down, he will be captured and his family will be done in. That was a two face that was presented to him. But his logic said, oh wait a minute, but if I do what God says, such and such will happen. Has that ever happened to you? Has God spoken to you and you felt like you needed to do something or he wanted you to do but you start making excuses on why it's not such a good idea? I had a lot of reasons why it's not a good idea to come to Isamsville, Maryland to start a church. I had a lot of reasons why it wouldn't work. This is not where I would start a church. Not because I have anything against this town but because it's to me, by right, somebody from New York City, this is not suburbs. This is the suburbs of the suburbs of the suburbs. <laughs> right? And, and uh, I, I'm, uh, you know, used to inner city and, and some. So obviously I wouldn't pick this place, but I'm telling you that God led us here to this place. And you know what? God knew what he was doing. And he still knows what he was doing. So, so here's the thing. Forget your logic. What is your logic based on? The wisdom of the world, your logic, is like foolishness to God, the Bible says. And the foolishness of God trumps our wisdom. Right? So I, I kind of now show logic to him. My mind tells me things. Oh, it doesn't look like, I don't care what my mind thinks. You know why? It's not because I'm so smart. It's because I follow my logic a lot of times and I saw what that led. And after a while, your may start to learn the lesson. Amen? Better that we learn it quickly. Isn't it crazy? Jeremiah had no excuse. I'm sorry, Zedekiah had no excuse because he had seen the things that, that Jeremiah had prophesied come true. He saw it for his his brother, and for his brother's father, and uh, uh, for the first one, Jehoram, who only lasted three months. And he saw it when there were false prophets, one of them I remember was named Hananiah in the book of Jeremiah. And he was prophesying the opposite of what Jeremiah was uh, prophesying. And Jeremiah said, you know what, because you did that, you're going to die. And two months later, he died. So he had all this evidence that obviously Jeremiah isn't speaking out of his face. Jeremiah has some connection with God. Also obvious by the fact that he called him to ask him, how to come over here. He wasn't supposed to call him because the people wanted to kill him. And Jeremiah was afraid of the official that wanted to kill him. So he said, uh, you know, he did it secretly. And then he promised, and he made Jeremiah promise, if you read the story, don't tell anybody that I met with you. So obviously, he knew that Jeremiah was a man of God. He's asking Jeremiah what to do with no intention of, of following, even though, and then he starts making excuses with his logic. That's how we are as people. That's the condition that we are in. Pretty sad, wouldn't you say? Proverbs 28, 26 says this. This is the English Standard Version. I love the way he puts it. Whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool. But he who walks in wisdom will be delivered. Where does wisdom come from? From the Lord, from the throne of God. 
Then there's Proverbs, right? Uh, chapter 3, verses 4 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do what? Lean not on your own understandings. Paraphrase logic. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. That, that's, that's wisdom for us. And he also tells us, right? This, this, I get it. I get this now. I so get this. When he says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. And my ways are not your ways. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my thoughts above your thoughts and my ways above your ways. And let me tell you something. When God has moved in my life, when I've asked for something from God, I have not ever guessed how he was going to deliver. I have not ever guessed how he was going to do the thing. He always did it in a way that just totally blew me away. I would have never guessed it in a million years of how God moves because I don't think like him. And I, 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 my ways are not his. I have to depend on him because he's the one who knows everything. I know nothing. We have to understand that. What do you and I know? We know absolutely nothing. Look at the experts that are telling us how many times have they told us different things about how we should treat it in this virus or what's going to happen if that doomsday thing of too many people gone. They said all kinds of things. Put on masks. No, don't put on masks. Leave it for the surgeon. Oh, yeah, you better put on masks. Oh, yeah, you better take them off. But well, what do I do? I mean, you know, I have a conniption trying to follow what they're saying because they really don't know. Trust me, they don't know. They have no idea. Listen, how can a computer tell you what's going to happen in the future? Come on, let's wake up. How can they tell you? How does a computer know how God's going to move? God can just say, stop. The whole thing stop, and it goes away. Amen. Or God can say, you know what? Wear your mask and hide. They're still going to get you. Because there's judgment. But he can do that. You can't get away from God. It's like they think God's not sitting on his throne. Amen? Now I'm getting all worked up. <laughs> Tell me if you come. Another lesson that we get. We better get this one. What God said will happen will most assuredly happen. If God says that something's going to happen, then it's going to happen. Right? Some people get lulled to sleep because. It doesn't happen fast enough. Oh, God's not really looking. He's not really paying attention. That's what happened to Israel. Oh, yeah, we can do whatever we want. God never. Right? But whatever God says is going to happen, you can bet that it's going to happen. Actually, don't bet. <laughs> God will disobedient. <laughs> Jeremiah, listen. 39, 4 to 7. Here's where the chickens come home to roost. When Zedekiah, king of Judah, and all the soldiers saw them, who, the Babylonians that had come, just as Jeremiah said, they fled. They left the city at night by way of the king's garden through the gate between the two walls and headed toward the Arab. But the Babylonian army pursued them and overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho. They captured him and took him to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and Ribla in the land of Hamas, where he pronounced sentence on him. There at Ribla, the king of Babylon slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes and also killed all the nobles of Judah. Then he put out Zedekiah's eyes and bound him with bronze shackles to take him to Babylon. Two choices, two fates. Either one would happen. Think about it. Think about what God put in the hand of this evil king. You can live. Your family will live. Israel will not burn down. He's putting this choice in the hands of this evil king. Here's the other choice. Don't listen to what I said. This is the other choice. And what will happen if you don't listen? You will be overtaken by the king of Babylon. Your family will pay the price. And you 
will be subject to the king of Babylon. What God says is going to happen, you can be sure that it's going to happen. In Isaiah chapter 46, verse 11, listen to this with soberness. The Lord speaking, he says, as soon as the prophet Isaiah, he says this, from the east I summon a bird of prey, from a far off land a man to fulfill my purpose. What I have said, that will I bring about. What I have planned, that will I do. In other words, he has the whole world at his disposal. If he wants to deliver something through a bird of prey and have something that bird of prey does, he just summons him. If he wants a man to do something, let me tell you something about kings and presidents and governors and mayors and, and, and all the governing authorities in this land and around the world. The Bible says that God even holds their heart in the palm of his hand and he can turn any way he wants to do his bidding. Nobody can escape the will of God. God has used Wicked people. In this case, Nebuchadnezzar was being used by God to exact judgment on Israel and, by the way, on other parts of the world. Then he used uh, uh, kings who were pagan kings uh, from the uh, empire that took over, which was the, the Persian Empire, thank you. And he used the kings, Darius and Cyrus and others, Artaxerxes, to bring the people back. In other words, they, they had them captured. They had these people captured. And God turned their hearts so they would show favor to the people of God. They didn't even know why they were doing it. Oh, go back and I'll help you. And I'll send you material to rebuild the wall and to rebuild the temple. So that, and this was prophesied too. You can read about King Darius uh, 150 years before he was born. Now God has selected him to help Israel get back to the promised land. What a God we serve. A God that knows the beginning from the end. Why wouldn't we ask? Why wouldn't we go to him for counsel? Why wouldn't we listen to what he said? Why do we disobey? Even as his followers, you know it's the hardest thing, like I said. If you hear counsel from the Lord, follow it, please, so that it will go well with you. Not so that the counselor will feel good about himself. By the way, find a counselor who's going to counsel you from the Word of God, not from his or her opinion. Find somebody that knows Jesus to counsel you. There are counselors that know Jesus. Otherwise, they're counseling you from the wisdom of those psychology books. So let me tell you something. Some of those psychologists are this loopy. How do I know? I've counseled some of those psychologists. And they're sitting there telling me what they think, and I'm going, oh my goodness, and people are going to them to get counsel. They don't think they're running around in circles themselves. They're loopy. And they're trying to show people, but what are they doing? They, 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 they're doing what, what, what a book tells them to do. Well, someone, someone wrote a book, this is our wisdom. Someone wrote a book and they said, oh, this is the human brain, and this is how it works. And the right bow, if you do the right bow, right, and the left bow, come along. And, and they, they figured all this out, totally bypassing the wonder of how we were made. How can you figure out a mind and how it works? Everybody's different. Did you know that you're unique? You know when God made you, that's it? There's nobody else like you in the entire world. You can use one book and one set of philosophy to tell somebody what's going to happen or how they should act. No, you can't bypass God with a book. You have to go to God and get counsel from Him because He knows you, because He's the one who made you. Who better to know how something works than the one who made it? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord Jesus. And here I'm going to close with this. Just to bring it all home, there's only two paths to choose from. Very simple. One leads to life and one leads to there's a crossroads in life. One is easy to get to and through, but there are horrible consequences. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19 and 20. Way back then, this is what the word of the Lord said. Today I have given you the choice between life.
life and death, between blessing and cursing, and curses. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you made. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. You can make this choice by loving the Lord your God, obeying him, and committing yourself firmly to him. This is the key to your life. Did you hear it? Did you hear the key? The word of God has given you the key to your life. Choose life by how? By loving the Lord your God. You have a problem with that is be honest. If, if you don't love him like you should, that's okay. God doesn't get mad when he knows you have a heart condition. He just asks you to help to, to help you with that. Just ask him, help me. I don't love you like I should. Would you? He does something called circumcision of the heart. In other words, he touches you so that that callous heart is exchanged for a heart of flesh, a heart where his word can get in. He even does that for you. But, but know that you have to love the Lord your God with all your heart. Why? Because if you don't, your heart will go astray. It's just what it does. The heart is deceptively weak. It is, is, is wicked. Deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? And here's another way to put it from the New Testament about choosing life or death. In Romans chapter 8, verse 13 and 15, I'm going to end with this. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves, so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by we cry out, by Him we cry out, Abba, Father. Listen to the two faiths. Death versus life. Being slaves to being children of God. As through Moses and Joshua back then, God spoke and said, choose this day whom you will serve. I say to all of us, let's serve the Lord Jesus with all of our heart and leave everything else behind. Choose life by loving the Lord your God, obeying him and committing yourself totally to him. Here's the two leaders of the life, death and life. John 10, 10. For the thief comes only to steal, steal, kill, and destroy. That's that one path. The other path. But I have come, praise God, in Jesus' name, to give you life. And to give you life to full measure. Let's bow our heads. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. God, for, for giving us the choice of life. God, give us, Lord God, the wisdom and the strength, oh Lord God. Lord, and the fortitude to choose life, oh Lord God. I pray, God, that you would help us by touching our hearts in a way, Father, that you give us the ability to love you with all of our heart and soul and live, because that's what happens when we love you with all of our heart and soul, oh Lord God. And not only do we live, oh God, but Lord, there's so much life in us then. That, Lord, that life is like rivers of living water, just like your word says, oh God, and that life touches other lives, oh God. And we stop being, oh God, selfish, only caring about our own way, only thinking about ourselves, oh God, and we become an instrument in your hands of love, oh God, to help and serve others, Lord Jesus, and live a full life, oh Lord God, instead of a small one, Lord Jesus. God, I pray that you help us, Lord Jesus. Help us, oh God to make the right choice for the rest of our life and to stay on that path, oh God. And Lord, that every decision on that path, God, we would run to you, God. Whether it be very small or very large, God, that we wouldn't do one thing without asking for direction, oh God, so that it would go well with us and with our family and with our friends, oh God, and with our circle of influence, Lord Jesus, so that your name could be glorified through our lives. Lord, I ask this in Jesus' name. With our heads still bowed and eyes closed, if there's somebody here or maybe somebody at home who doesn't know Christ or is not following Jesus right now, maybe at one time you did, but you're not following him right now, 
and God is speaking to your heart and make it right with him today, if you would raise your hand and let me know who you are, I just want to lead you in a prayer that will bring you back right in right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Is anybody here uh, the Lord has spoken to and you need to get right with God, you need to get back on the path that leads to life before we uh, move on? Amen. If you're at home and you or want to make that decision, I'm going to pray in faith. I'm going to say a prayer that you can pray with me so that the Lord will meet you right where you are, right where you are, and you will come into the family of God today. Pray this prayer. Say, dear Jesus, thank you for your mercy and your grace. Jesus, I believe that you are who you say you are. You are the Son of God. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins and for the sins of the world, and I believe that you rose on the third day. Lord Jesus, I admit, Lord God, that I am a sinner and I've done many things wrong. And today I'm asking you to forgive me and cover me by the blood that you spilled at Calvary, Lord God. Today I give you my life, I give you my heart in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for those that are coming into the kingdom right now. Father, I can't see them, Lord, but you know who they are, Lord, as they listen to this. And God, it's your words that they're hearing, not mine. Father, I pray that you would watch over them and God lead them in the right direction. Father, from this point forward, in Jesus' name, with our heads still bowed and eyes closed, uh, for those of us here and those of us at home, you are following Christ, but you are kind of uh, been stumbling along the road, uh, stumbling along the right choices, or maybe uh, had, had been walking without realizing that sometimes we get so caught up in life and all the circumstances of life that we forget to ask. And today you want to come back and say, you know what, I, I, I want to do everything that you're saying, Lord. I want, to, I want to choose life today. If God is speaking to your heart, would you raise your hand? I just want to pray for us this afternoon before we close. Yes, I see your hands over here. I see your hands over here to the, to the left. Anybody else before we pray? Say, include me in that prayer. I want to make the right choice. I, I am a follower of Christ, but I need help right now. Anybody else before we pray? Amen. Let's pray. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, thank you, God, for those that you're touching right now, Father. And Lord, give them the help that they need, God. They need a boost. And Lord, your Holy Spirit gives us that, oh God. Lord, I pray, Father, you would descend, oh Lord God, and your Lord, you would take up residence, not just residence, but Lord, take control, oh Lord God, as we give you control of our lives, oh God, so that we will always make the right choice. But make that first one, God, to stay on the right road that leads to righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Lord, we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we all stand? Amen. Amen. You know, I started out this day. Yesterday we celebrated Independence Day in this country. And we thank God for the freedom that we have to worship, right? Even though we're worshiping here with masks on and we have to practice social distancing, yet we still have the freedom of worship. We better not take it for granted. How many took for granted that you could just come to church anytime you want and uh, you had a rude awakening <laughs> for a few months, right? I never thought that that would happen. But you know what? Today, I was thinking, I'm celebrating Dependence Day today. Dependence on our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what I'm celebrating today. I depend on him for everything. I've become a big baby running to God for everything. That's what he wants us to do. He, didn't he say we have to become like a little child and trust him with everything? Well, let's celebrate Dependence Day today as we go out and be the people of God that he wants us to be in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for coming. If you can come Tuesday and help us pray, do that.